Thanks for, thanks for coming. My name is Stuart Trusty. Uh, I've been working in crypto, but uh, earliest, you know, let's go back to 1994. I was working, I was the, the, the original technologist for Alibaba, had the third internet service provider in Seattle. I was working with this gentleman here, Greg Paley. We did a lot of things in the uh, early, early days of the uh, internet. Um, and at that time, it was a very excited group of people, um, Linux, um, internet, free software. And it really had a promise for giving a lot of um, empowerment to people. And, and, it, and it did do that. But along the way, um, some things have happened that um, kind of uh, dis dissolved a lot of, a lot of the, the philosophy and the, uh, the values that were driving it initially. And <clears throat> where we're at today with crypto is at a similar junction. And I just want to give a, a little, you know, walking back memory lane from the from the time of uh, you know when when Linux and general public license started, and to kind of look at what exactly happened to 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 lead that movement to where it is now, which is nowhere. Kind of timely, last couple of days, uh, you know, Richard Stallman was uh, no longer on the board of uh, Free Software Foundation, and and for some 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 reasons that I'm not going to go into that I, I don't carry one way or another, but it kind of marks the. The, the life cycle of this movement, and I'm and I'm hoping to convey to anyone that's that's interested how we might want to consider uh, uh, avoiding that now and uh, maybe remedying some of the the past uh, activity that did what it did here. So um, one of, one of the things about the free software movement, it it you know uh, a big voice at that time was Sage, uh, you know the System Administrators Guild. It had a, a code of ethics that were they were pretty good. Um, you know, operations parameters and, and, and uh, guidelines for how one should conduct themselves with these machines and these networks. Um, and um, that, that's kind of one of the places things went, went awry here. Um, um, so, so what I want to look at is I want to see what, what happened, what actually happened, what was the result, and, and what, 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 is that, what were the symptoms of, of that happening to the, to the free software committee and the user committee in general? And, uh, and, and the results, and the results really was, um, you know, that there's unhappy users or there's, there's, you know, not as happy users as there could be. So um, the question I'm gonna ask here is what, what can restore this and what can we do to prevent this as crypto comes and follows almost in the same footsteps with the same kind of uh, values, you know, cypherpunk values, um, you know, et cetera. Um, So what we're not talking about, we're not talking about um, you know, carnivore where the government is taking all the emails in off the internet and scanning them. We're not talking about the back doors being put in, in all the routers. Um, this is a running joke, you know, if you wanna, you, if you wanna be free from the, the US back doors, you don't get Cisco. If you wanna be free from the Chinese doors, you can't do, do Huawei. If you wanna go with the, with the Israeli back doors, you don't do Juniper and you have to set up your infrastructure that, that way. We're not talking about that, although that is a problem. We're not talking about the X key score stuff that, that uh, Snowden revealed about you know, how easy it is for you know, snooping to take place, but we are talking about what made that become so easy to happen. Why, why, did, why was that just a gimme? Um, and, and the free software movement, it was, it was very, as, as probably everyone here knows, it was, very, it was a very exciting time. Um, it was to be free, you know, have a free access to intellectual property that you could own, free from the abuses of centralized companies uh, and, and licenses. Secure open platforms, you know, um, you know, just something that's right out there for everyone to look at and audit and try to break and can't break it. And together, you know, we have this secure platform that we've built. Um, and also with that was freedom to share ideas. Um, there wasn't uh, a sense of, you know, this software, you know, if I have this idea, if I, if I write this down, I'm going to share it with you. And it's your right to share it with everyone else. We're not going to try to copyright shovels and, you know, make it difficult for you know, miners to dig and charge license fees. It was like, it was, it was supposed to be a new slate, a, a new era for this. So what happened? Well, the first thing that happened is when it came on, on the scene, general public license and Linux, it started making waves in about 1994 with the, with the Linux, uh, alpha Linux kernel. Um, as it approached, you know, 1998, 1999, it was, it, was, it was more and more something that had to be reckoned with. And so Microsoft was one of the main stakeholders in that conversation, and there were a lot of meetings. Um, there were meetings with like Red Hat and IBM and those guys, and they go, what are we gonna do to deal with this 
situation because if we embrace this free software, it's going to go viral in our companies. It's going to screw up our intellectual property and our licensing. What can we do to be, you know, to stay alive? So they came up with this idea of, um, you know, it was GPL, general public license. It was copyleft. It was free softwares and free beer. It was your right to own as a legal principle. It's literally your right to own this software. No one can take it from you. But they changed it into open source, and they changed the language just a little bit. And so the, G, the, the free software would go, yeah, open source, yeah, okay, we can live with that. And the business could live with that, but it didn't mean it was free anymore. So all of a sudden, there was a different flavor to the, the movement that was going on as everyone embraced this um, open source paradigm. And at the start of this, we had you know, Richard Stallman, who I mentioned. We had Linus Torvalds that, that wrote Linux, and then kind of the prophet of the whole situation. Eric Raymond writing the Cathedral and Bazaar, a very exciting time. Um, you know, these days probably, you know, we have Satoshi, we have Vitalik, and we have maybe, you know, like him or not, Roger Ver, who's, who's pretty much, you know, preaching a different kind of message. But these guys have been out there pushing this from the very start. Um, and what happened from, a, from the Linux point of view? You know, you had this open source ecosystem. All the source was out there. People were compiling their own complete operating systems. And then there appeared some, some different things within the Linux system. And there's this ongoing talk of this, this idea of embrace, extend, extinguish, where some of these this controlled opposition to some of these technologies would come in and, yeah, let's, let's do it with you guys and let's make it all, the, do it all these great things and get all these copyrights and all of these you know, um, you know, patents in place around it. And all of a sudden, ah, we don't like this anymore. We're going to kill it. And by killing it at that level, they kind of you know, killed the original graph that they were embracing to, to begin with. So that was kind of one of the strategies that kind of undermined this. And one of the first things was um, the SE, SE Linux patches uh, that were from the NSA. Now, I was originally working on this in the cluster high performance computing environment. Um, I, I did an operating system with, um, with uh, Los Alamos, and we were selling those to the government and the labs and the military, you know, Dahlgren Naval Surface Warfare classified systems. Um, this was, um, this was th we, so we wanted to have a secure um, supercomputing platform. And this is when they were just trying to get tra traction with this SE Linux, this security enhanced Linux. The longer we, the longer we, 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 did, we did port it out there, we sold some of these systems, but we kept progressing and pro pro progressing with this you know, Flask architecture. And we really realized that there was only one place that really understood this completely, and that was the NSA. It just, it would just, it got too, Harry, as you got on, as the farther you get into it, it got more and more difficult to um, to bring back to a user level to where you can deliver a system to the user that they're going to understand, and that's kind of the key. And th and this happened in a different way. You know, initially we had you know Linux on you know the, the cell phone with the Android, and that was great. Oracle had 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 the, their little you know JVM thing, and then you know um, the, the Google kind of took that and. They keep adding to it, but it's gotten to the point now where this, 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 what we know is this Google, you know, operating system. It's it's a lot, of, a lot of spyware, a lot of backdoors, a lot of uh, vendors getting in on the action, like Samsung trying to put their little hooks in, and everyone's kind of getting into your data. So um, that kind of overcame the the aspect of Linux in its initial en envisionment to let you know have this open, free platform where people were not doing these abuses to it. Along with that, there was this laziness that happened. And all of a sudden, it was like software as a service was like, OK, well, you know, Salesforce works. Let's just do that. And you know, I don't care what it's written in. I don't care if it's on Windows. Let's just do what works. And um, you know, I was actually, I was working with Jack Ma. He was, he, we, were, we were getting um, the China pages and the, and the Alibaba set up. And I kept saying, look, you guys got to start from scratch. You know, China needs a secure operating system. Um, you can't be relying on Windows. And he said, Stuart, you know, your mind has some sort of virus. Why would we want to use something that doesn't work instead of something that does? And he, he could not see that, that there was a reason to build up your own public you know, infrastructure. He didn't, he didn't really grasp that, that component of the, of the free software movement. Um, but uh, you know, GitHub started getting written into the, in the source trees. We all started using Git and everything. And it's like, OK, well, now it's a service. We don't need to host that. And OK, Microsoft bought it. And that's OK. We'll just keep using it. And then, then what happens? You know, Microsoft starts abusing it and censoring it, and, and maybe for good reason in their one case. But we just let that happen. We let it all slip out of our hands. And um, we got lazy, and then no one cared anymore. 
No one cared whether it was Linux or it was free. They didn't even know. They got bamboozled with, with the, the tenets of the, the open source versus free software because you had you know, this open source narrative that kind of you know, dimmed the understanding about what you know, Stallman and, and Torvalds, what they were actually doing to begin with, and it kept marginalizing so, uh, uh, you know, Stallman, so he kept looking like a bigger and bigger freak. And uh, the, 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 the storyline got lost. While that was going on, um, these black boxes started to plague more and more of the industry, especially down to the CPU level. Uh, Ron Minnick, who's, who we worked at Los Alamos uh, with on this um, cluster operating system, he exposed that um, every one of the management engine Intel CPUs was actually running a copy of Minix that no one can get to. That was actually slow and insecure, but it was a complete backdoor into every single CPU. Black boxes started showing up, these you know, cult little binary objects in AMD, all the GPUs. So you really at no time can you ensure that anything you're typing or anything you're doing has any real level of security. Um, so that got to be a problem. Um, the, and, and one, we have to look at some, some solutions. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you recover from that? Every CPU that you touch has is, is got a back door. So <clears throat> while that was going on, and while the government's, you know, the NSA's got the SC Linux patches coming in, then, you know, the market for these operating systems, you know, was saturated by CNEs, Microsoft people, Microsoft certified. And they have a certain way, you know, you have a certain way of going about your, your registries and all these things. And, you know, for years and years and years, the, um, there's been a Unix, actual Unix philosophy. And one of those things is, you, you know, you do, you do one, a program that does one thing well, you just, just a short, you just do it once. Um, you, do, you do it so it pipes input from one and output to another. And, and, then, and that's, you know, some of the basics. Um, and it uses this thing called the System 5 init, which just tells you all the programs that run when it starts up. Well, as the industry got more complex, or the hardware got more complex, it's like, well, is this USB driver running yet? And is my PCIe, you know, is, is, is this subsystem running? And, and is, it, is my network up online? And, and it got to be a little bit more complex. Nothing that couldn't be handled with one or two queries in a shell script. But instead, what, 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 what got pushed was this system D. And it's almost an operating system within an operating system. It's, it's, it's basically a control mechanism that, that, that actually increased the complexity significantly. Yes, it answered some of these questions about, you know, is this, operate, is, this, is this part of the system up before I run my program? But what it did is it made it so complicated that, that um, most, of, most of the users at a certain level were lost. And, and the Windows people loved it fine because it added a whole other directory tree and a whole other set of, uh, of ways of getting on the file system that were foreign to the Unix philosophy. But they, they were able to do that, and Red Hat embraced it. So all of a sudden, you have this, you know, from, from just being an average user, you have what's almost become an adversarial um, system setup thing that you actually had to fight against and look, look for all these helps to get through. So it made it more complicated. But it, it, was, it was against the Unix philosophy. And then what happens is that the Debian team, the one that was the purest Linux movement, they decided to go with the system, away from the System 5 init, which was the core Unix philosophy, and onto this System D. So because Ubuntu was based on that, everyone else moves to it. Um, and along with this, while this was going on, we had a lot of you know, OS agnostic virtual machines and ways to run those, uh, run Linux within Windows, within Linux within Windows, and oh, it's just all one big you know, non-distinguished group of intellectual property that who knows who owns what, but somehow it's open source and we don't care because it works. So it got really dirty, in other words. Um, and, and what were some of these ethical principles that we've seen? What, what, what happened, uh, you know, some of the, some of the stuff? Um, well, there is a code of ethics that should be in place with advanced technology. And when you have everything focused on, let's put back doors into things. I mean, some of these things, like, don't break into anyone else's machine. Don't go read their email. Um, you know, don't, don't be, don't make your service secure. Don't, don't be putting these back doors in these public devices. So just some basic common sense stuff. <coughs> Um, but without that, the whole industry turned into the classic, um, let me see, the imp impacts of this. Um, what, what that approach to everything done, the, 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 the symptom that that was, was that 
it created, it went back to security by obscurity, or in other words, really no security, or who el whoever will pay the most to get the information. The SE Linux was, became security by obscurity. System D obscured a lot of things for some people, but um, you know, with the Android SDK and then not being able to audit or control what is going on at the hardware level of these phones and of these machines and these CPUs, um, you know, um, integrating the Google services, what, what, does it end up to, what does it end up to when you start breaching all these ethical principles and these principles of, you know, of Unix philosophy? Uh, you know, make the things make the things easy to make make things easy to understand and share. You know, make programs that do one thing well, pipe contact for another. What happened to all that? It ended up in all of these unhappy users. And um, why are they unhappy? Well, they, they, it went back from free back to centralization. It went back to people upholding this, this principle became marginalized, and then, then it starts in on censorship on these marginalized areas. Now, I'm not saying that it's, it's massively censored right now, but that, that, that's what's in control is this kind of thing. And in, in one word, disempowerment. The empowerment that was promised to people by the free software movement turned into disempowerment. Just one more chapter of disempowerment. So, um, you know, if we go back into the earliest days, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about Android, we're talking about Linux, well, if you look at Apple, you know, Steve Jobs, he came out, they had the Microsoft, we had, the, had the, you know, Mac OS. And, you know, that was a nice, pretty operating system that he stole from Xerox, Park, but, you know, made, made, made it better. But the thing is that, was he a, a proponent of, the, of this evolutionary free software kind of thing? Well, some people tested him, and they did the new Prometheus League, and they leaked the software to Macintosh, and they're hoping maybe Steve would go, oh, that's okay, you know. But he didn't. They, they clamped down, and, and they tightened the screws, they tightened the licensing, and um, you know later uh, they do embrace as a better, more solid operating system the Unix, you know, like a BSD under under thing. But BSD had slightly different principles. You know, you, you could you could expand the operating system, but withhold how you did it, so people would you know, have to be more beholden to you. So really, if we look at where we've come all the way through, you know, the Intel, AMD, Linux. Uh, Android, all this phenomenon, free software world, we're really no different than Apple is now. We came the whole way to get back to this is all proprietary intellectual property, and, and you know we're the proprietor. We're not. We're, you're not going to benefit as the, as the user. So I don't know about everyone else, but that that, that makes me a little unhappy. So <clears throat> back to why are the user unhappy? You know the, the little nickel and dime licensing or excessive license fees having to continually be subjected to these click click through agreements the higher service costs and and, and for, for the, the more you know on the edge someone is with their development you know having to uh, be up against digital tyranny in, in in some form so the question becomes in in my mind what was the best that that intended what was the best you know highest purpose of that free software movement what what was there that, that was worth salvaging um, and one of the things I see is that there's, there's movement now back to more open CPUs and, and hopefully GPUs. Um, the IBM RISC is being used, and, and I think it's Raptor Computing, and then so there's some other, there's two other CPU manufacturers. <coughs> uh, one's in US and one's in China. I know um, Luke uh, Kasson Kent Layton, he's working on, on what the one that's not the Chinese one. But there is an open um, CPU standard that's emerging. Um, and I know, I can't remember if it's NVIDIA or AMD, but one of them has been used relatively good speeds that um, doesn't require that, that black box inside the, in, in the firmware. Now there's, you know, starting with this Huawei nonsense, you know, and everyone putting back doors in each other's things. I mean, I've, I found back doors in Foscam cameras. Um, you know, all, everyone's, the, the, this, this trade situation, for example, between China and US, the problem is that there's no, there's no fair middle playing ground. You, you can't take your laptop over there and, and expect that it's, it's, it's not being used in some you know, intelligence gathering you know, function. Um, so you know, US doesn't want Huawei phones. Huawei doesn't want the Cisco routers. They don't want, they don't want any of this technology. But um, there, there, there is a ability to bring it back on an ethical standard away from the interests of abusive um, IT motives within government. And what I'm saying is it's good to have 
you know, uh, government, you know, intelligence for, uh, you know, using the, the technology, but it has to be operated in, in an ethical framework. So if, if you need, if you, you know, you're not there trying to collect zero day exploits, you're trying to, to publish all this stuff so everyone gets some fix. It's a different mentality. And if we can, if we can get that to where we have transparent certification for hardware, like, okay, well, I'm offering this hardware. Um, there's a gentleman here selling, um, you know, some wallets, some very high end wallets. Um, you know, after seeing how easy it is to break into Trezor and some of those things with the, with the right with the right instruments, I mean, we need a way to verify all this stuff. How can we buy anything, especially in crypto, um, if uh, we're unsure about the hardware platform? Um, so, um, that, that I think that that can be achieved, and then perhaps at the Linux level, forking Debian and Ubuntu, you know, Ubuntu, you know, get the SC Linux out, just get the system D out of it, get it back to where it's. Um, you know, if we're going to be running it, I think that IBM is a risk uh, power seven or power 11. I think that's an open audited uh, processor with no back doors. Um, you know, that, that's kind of the way out of this. Um, but these, these problems are going to be facing crypto. I mean, <clears throat> originally it was, um, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And then the banks, the biggest stake as, as the, you know, aggrieved party came in. They, instead of Microsoft coming and looking at free software, it was the banks coming and looking at this Bitcoin and, it's blockchain. So all of a sudden we have a blockchain conference and we're blockchain now, we're not Bitcoin. Bitcoin had some, some different principles, you know, fundamentally associated with it. But now we got something everyone else agree on. So we've changed the language already at this stage. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying it can't evolve or it shouldn't evolve, but you know, when we go start adding features to our software, I mean, are we absolutely sure? I mean, I don't know, I haven't read all the SegWit code, but is this, is this another module like, you know, um, whether it's SE Linux or whether it's uh, systemd, I mean, is this, is this everything we think it is? Was this the answer to expand the block size or maybe Roger Ver had it right? Maybe we should have just left it at eight, eight gig. I mean, the segue, okay, we're, we're compressing the blocks, but what, what is the result here? Is, is lightning really the solution that was envisioned? Isn't it just kind of moving beads back and forth on a string between points? Um, so there, there's, there's large amounts of money that are available to back different movements anonymously or silently. So we got to be careful of what we're letting into the mainstream of our software and who we're letting letting in, and we have to remember, you know, um, someone's passing out the, this 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 here. I mean, this is really the heart of this, you know, of this movement of these of these kind of principles. Um, anarchy not meaning, you know, uh, everyone killing each other, but just less less legislation, less regulation, um, and, and then the spirit of freedom and the ability to give the user empowerment. It's all the same kinds of principles. But the, as much as we can preserve of that mentality, the better. Um, as we move forward, otherwise, you know, we're going to be able, we're going to be facing the same kind of freight, fate as, um, you know, Stallman and, and company. And, uh, you know I, know, I know Linus is making a decent living these days, but, you know, look what he did, you know, look at what everyone else is getting out of this. I mean, is that, was that the deal? Was that what was supposed to happen? So I think that, that there is a end goal, that there is a standard that can be achieved. And I think we should focus on interpenetrability, you know, impenetrability of, of whatever source. I, I don't want to be able to get into your box at a hackathon or otherwise. Your host or your laptop needs to be able to be secure to, to a due diligence standard. Your Wi-Fi router should not have back doors. These Wi-Fi routers have back doors. Um, the, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the cable routers have back doors. They're, they're all, they're just itching to take your data and abuse it. I'm not saying that they're spying on you, but they're probably selling the data. They're selling your, your, your metadata. Um, this was not the original idea. Um, the core routers, um, that's going to be a hard one because that's, that's, that's a deep government topic. But the Linux-based cell phones, like an open Android firmware and hardware that, that's audited to that standard, I think we could probably live with that even if the core routers are, are compromised at some level. But overall, you know, this, this Web3, the cryptocurrency, crypto platforms, they are the answer for today, I believe. And I, and I, don't, I don't think that any of these little crypto um, companies, I think they're all going to do good if they're given enough time. I, I think that they're all on the right path, just like, you know, the initial, the Linux stuff was. But um, the only way to, to really um, prevent this from, from a you know, dark future like, like, like may have been seen um, if, if the, the cryptocurrency didn't come up, if we were just stuck with, you know, Microsoft and AT&T and all these, all these things at that time. Um, the, only, the only way is that 
the, the, the philosophical and ethical issues that tripped up the entire movement um, need to be reexamined and, and, and reconsidered as, as the right way of, of dealing with computers and other people online. And on top of that, um, some of these philosophical standards need to be uh, re-understood by what, why was, what, what did Unix have to offer? Um, in this case, what does the crypto have to offer? What are, these, what are the fundamental values that we are embracing here? And then we don't want to be lazy and compromise those again. And uh, I think that that is the end. I, I understand I had half an hour. I tried to, to make it a little quick. What, uh, what time is it now? 28 after. Oh, good. Perfect time. Uh, and it's hard to describe my background, but if there's any questions about this, I've had my nose in the trenches for a while. I'll take any question in the last minute or two. Or comments? Editorial? Yes, sir. Well said. Okay, well, I think that was my allotted time, so thank you for. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.